in the future, I think gold and silver will be far better for having this very volatile um, uh, uh, demand factor. How could JP Morgan have acquired so much physical silver? In fact, uh, like for example, uh, there are estimates that it may be the largest hoard of physical silver ever amassed in the history of the world uh, without moving the market up or causing backwardation. I think it's, I mean, I don't know the answer to that, but I know how they might do it. Uh, and you've got to look and see who their customers are. I suspect on one side you have got um, mining companies. Um, they will lend money to mining companies against a certificate from Glencore or Trafigura about the, 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 the quantity of silver, say, in the dory that is processed at the mine head. Um, it will probably be uh, refined in China. Um, and um, effectively, uh, what, ha what ends up, what you end up with is the Chinese government owning the silver, um, but it will be on um, uh, J.P. Morgan's books. I think that's the, you know, that's the three, um, you know, the triangular uh, banking relationship. You've got mines on the one hand who need cash flow to pay for their miners and all the rest of it. You've got, you know, Trafigura and Glencore and similar um, assaying experts who will visit the mines and give a certificate um, as to what is actually there. That allows the mine to borrow money from JP Morgan in order to pay all the salaries and all the rest of it. The dory is then shipped for uh, refining. And where is it refined? In almost all these cases, I think it's refined in China. And so that, if you like, is sort of, a, a, you know, sort of while it's being refined, it appears on J.P. Morgan's book. So you have a situation where J.P. Morgan doesn't actually own the silver, but it's owned by its customers. And interestingly, um, quite some time ago, there was this, uh, there, there was, uh, you know, all sorts of theories that uh, J.P. Morgan was manipulating the market and all the rest of it. And I can't remember the name of the lady. There was a, um, a British girl who was head of commodities at the time. Uh, you may you may recall her name. Um, and she actually went on a, a television program and said that they did not take positions. They dealt for their clients. Now, that lady, I'm pretty sure, would not have lied um, in a public uh, arena like that. She would have, if they, if they actually had been involved with manipulating the market, that television uh, 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 snip would not have happened. I can tell you that for nothing. You know, bankers aren't fools. <laughs> Traders are fools, bankers are not. So I think that um, uh, we've got to look sort of, little bit of scans at the sort of idea that um, JP Morgan owns own huge amounts of silver. And of course, the other thing about it is that they may well have a position which they use um, to write options against. And they will write options not only on uh, Comex, but they'll also write, write them on the Ford market in London. So these are OTC options, which can be really quite substantial. So it's what I'm trying to say is that the situation I think is a lot more complex than you, you know, than the idea that you've got J.P. Morgan going in there and cornering the market. Please ask Alistair about his prediction that the, by the end of 2021, gold and silver uh, would end their COMEX market manipulation because of Basel III regulations changing. Uh, they are obviously still monkey hammering the gold and silver prices. What's his current outlook and understanding of that? Yeah, um, I think got to be sort of slightly careful. I never said that it would sort of just end like that with the introduction of um, the net stable funding ratio. Um, it's, it's, it's a situation where banks are likely over time to, um, if you like, uh, gradually begin to comply with it. Because, I mean, it doesn't ban a bank from running un unbalanced positions uh, in commodities or any other derivative. Um, what it does is it makes it expensive to finance unbalanced positions. And so you will get um, uh, banks management um, turning around to divisions, you know, trading divisions and all the rest of it. Over time, they will try and discourage them to from running unbalanced positions or at least can curtail them to a smaller quantity. And to some extent, the degree to which that happens is um, perhaps um, driven by the 
relative profitability of what they're doing. And there's no doubt that with, you know, if you look at uh, the gold and silver contracts, uh, both uh, in the forward markets in London and also on COMEX, there are huge profits being made by uh, the bullion banks wheeling and dealing. Now, against that, they've got the losses on their positions. So uh, they try and contain the, you know, contain those losses. But I can tell you from a trading point of view, I mean, they're always going to be short. Um, they will make a lot more money trading than they lose on the other side. So, um, uh, you know, when that changes, then you're likely to have a change in the situation. And I, th I do think that over time, banks will want to come in line with the Basel III net stable funding ratio requirements, simply from a reputational point of view. Um, you know, a bank which um, isn't running its finances properly will be seen as you know, potentially counterparty risk. So, uh, you know, I think I think market forces will drive it in that direction. But it's not as if suddenly, you know, um, you know, the regulations come in, bang, you must comply. No, it's, it's not the way it works. What we have seen, I think, and I think this is fair to say, is that um, the uh, uh, dollar prices or currency prices of, of, of gold and silver have been very much suppressed. Um, by a number of factors, if you like, uh, um, relative to what's going on in commodity markets. Now, um, you know, sort of uh, base metal prices, say, um, and energy prices, say, are not joined at the hip with uh, the values of gold and silver, um, but they're a lot more joined to gold and silver than they are to paper currencies. If you just look at the volatility of the price of oil, let's say, um, measured in dollars compared with uh, measuring it in gold, you can see that, you know, in gold, you know, the price of oil might double, it might halve. But with dollars, I mean, for goodness sake, you can go from minus $40 to currently 90, which is what we've had since um, April uh, 2020. So, I mean, it's less volatile. And I think that what that means is that um, as uh, commodity prices continue to rise, and incidentally, metals are really taking off at the moment. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the backwardations in, in 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 copper, aluminium. I mean, that's just gone through the roof. Uh, this is this is all new. Um, uh, it's, it's it has been really dramatic, um, and uh, I just you know I just th sort of think that um, it won't be very long before uh, you know people begin to understand. Hold on a minute. Um, you know, the only protection we've got in this is actually gold. The um, the other story that goes round, of course, is that, oh, well, you know, gold is yesterday's story, um, you know, in this mo new modern world, um, the way you protect yourself against currency debasement is by buying cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and all the rest of it. Now, that, I am sure, has taken quite a lot of the speculative punch out of gold buying. Um, and from I, my view on that is, thank goodness. Because the last thing I want to see is speculation in gold. And OK, it's given the, the bullion banks a temporary reprieve, if you like, on their short positions. Because, you know, the speculators have gone elsewhere. But um, I think when it comes to, um, you know, a sound market in the future, I think gold and silver will be far better for having this very volatile um, uh, uh, demand factor all pushed into cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. So I think it is, I think it's, we're on the cusp of change. Um, there is a, um, a, a, if you like, a technical pattern where the sort of the, the, the top line of a triangle is coming down to around about 1850. We're currently about 1840. So, you know, it's, it's looking like another challenge. It may not get through immediately. It might, you know, they might push it back and all the rest of it. But I think that game is getting very long in the tooth as far as the establishment is concerned. And I think the idea that they can continue to suppress gold, um, that I think is a story which is now coming to an end.